Cool. We are live. So we'll give it just a couple more minutes. Let some people join in here. And here's the link for YouTube, Lud. I'll just drop this into some of our channels. Mm -hmm. Cool. Welcome everyone who's joining us in from YouTube. Give it a couple minutes. Let some let some people join in here. A hey, cigar, Alexis. Cool. Thank, thanks a lot for, for joining us. Um, we'll get started here in you know about about one minute. Really excited to have Gleb from uh, T Systems joining us today. Talk about everything that they're all the cool stuff that they're working on and, and how they're powering Chainlink infrastructure. So should be a pretty, pretty exciting talk. Yeah, hello everyone, guys. Super excited to, to talk. Also excited about a more, let's say, more interactive Q&A session afterwards. To yeah, answer yeah. Questions. You're, you're, I know that your SmartCom presentation was definitely one of the, one of the, like, the top, top commented and uh, mm -hmm. responded in the, in the survey afterwards. So, so people, people really enjoyed you stepping in. I know that you, you even stepped in like last minute with that one too. Yeah, I'm yeah, but it, yeah, it, it was last minute, but not really. Like I mean, there was uh, anyways. We were prepared to talk about this thing, so we have a lot of discussions about this internally, anyway. So last minute was not such a big deal. Yeah, I, I love I love your background too that you got going on here. Thanks. <laughs> I, I mean, I had it before, but I thought maybe like not change it. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, it's looking good. I guess we are in a community which doesn't, I mean, yeah, it depends. I, I would say people don't really take themselves too seriously, which is a good thing. Uh, so that's, I guess, that's cool about, I guess, overall crypto community as a whole. So, yeah, no, it's good. It, it's nice seeing that coming from uh, like the enterprise side of the crypto world, too, you know, good, good, yeah. gives us help. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, everyone who's joined us today. Really excited to have Gleb Duca of T Systems joining us. Uh, a little bit about this presentation. Gleb's uh, going to go into a little more details about his presentation at SmartCon. Uh, you can definitely watch that one afterwards as well in, in our videos here on YouTube. Um, and then after that, we're going to have an interactive Q&A session. So if you have questions, make sure to drop them into the YouTube chat, uh, be able to pull them and then moderate those from here. Uh, but again, Glove, really excited to, to have you, and thanks a lot for joining. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting, and thanks a lot for organizing. So I guess I'll jump right into this, right? Yeah, yeah. If you want to just jump right in, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Spend deck. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just call, call, collapse all the tabs, oops. Yeah, okay, so hello everyone. Really excited to to see you here. <laughs> to, more excited to be answering your questions uh, uh, later on. So as Keenan pointed out, um, I'm basically gonna talk about, uh, I'm, I'm glad from T-Systems, um, MMS, and I'm going to talk about uh, basically us running a Chainlink node. Uh, I had a similar talk at the SmartCon, uh, so I tried to kind of put more more content, like newer content into that. So basically I'll talk about, first of all, about training and, and the systems MMS. So how this, how does this work? What are we actually doing and how this all, how this all came to be basically? Then I'll talk about our broader kind of from a macro standpoint, uh, our infrastructure thesis. So the way we look at the blockchain infrastructure, at node operation and staking, staking as a service and so on and so forth. And then I basically provide outlook uh, on where we are going, like where I think the space is heading, as well as then I would be more than glad to answer all, all the questions. Uh, so just a few words about me. So who am I? Gleb um, Dutka again, uh, my role in- Stack Club. Yep. Um, I, I think your mic has a, a little bit of an echo. Okay. Uh, kind of going in and out. Um, uh, is it better now? Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds a lot better. Okay. So, yeah, so my role is uh, I'm a product owner at uh, T Systems MMS around all things uh, basically providing Web3 infrastructure, which includes running nodes, taking as a service, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, they are, I'm always trying to clarify the letter T, right? They are, uh, there's Deutsche Telekom and a lot of people saying like, this looks like T-Mobile. Yes, yes it does because T-Mobile is actually a subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom. So Deutsche Telekom is the big uh, like mother company, um, the, the Deutsche Telekom group. And we are the largest telecommunications uh, company in Europe uh, by revenue. And there are different subsidiaries. So T-Mobile is one of those as well as the T-Systems where I'm, where I'm based. More precisely, I'm based in Blockchain Solutions Center of T-Systems Multimedia Solutions. And basically, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of companies and they're all obviously interconnected and 100% subsidiaries, but just to like make it clear, um, well, what I find pretty exciting about our Blockchain Solutions Center is that we are basically working very closely within the Digital Trust Unit, which combines security, data privacy and blockchain together. So when you look at the Web3 infrastructure, so running nodes and especially like business, like Oracle related business models where you provide data, I believe this is a very nice basically match uh, because we can just not purely look at things from the blockchain, but we can just basically also look at the, all those business models from the very deep security standpoint, as well as from, from the privacy standpoint. Okay. so. Basically, to, to wrap it up, and some things have changed since I last talked at uh, SmartQuan. So where are we are today? We are currently running, uh, we are live on 33 price feeds. So last time I talked was five, I guess. So it's like more than what, 600% uh, growth, which is, which is nice since last time. Uh, we are, I mean, essentially what we do as a node operator, we are providing price data uh, to, the, to the like oracles, mostly like to the various, decentralized applications mostly you currently utilized by by DeFi applications so i mean there are plenty of uh, very cool companies utilizing the data we provide like synthetics our it would be like some of the i guess more prominent examples of the DeFi applications um so with this uh, as basically as I said, we help secure some of the value on the DeFi application level. So currently, I mean, 12.5 billion, which is still growing. Most of that, as far as I remember, is powered by Chaining. Uh, in with this, basically, like where does this, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, where, where did this Web3 infrastructure provisioning as an enterprise actually, actually came from? So, when we look at the DeFi, at the decentralized finance, uh, it's a lot about. I mean, it says basically in its name, it's it has to be it has to be decentralized. So, it by default or by definition, it basically it eliminates uh, a lot. It, it 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 disintermediates a lot of players which are active in let's say traditional finance. I mean, enterprises. I would put uh, in the same bucket. Uh, because enterprises have been like basically working with mostly uh, with, with central, very centralized business models. And now as we see basically the space becoming more and more uh, decentralized, as I believe it should, uh, big companies are finding it's very harder to basically get a very strong right to play on the application level of, and I mean, DeFi would be the most prominent example I, I, of, of that, I guess. So I, I, at, at this point in time, I find it pretty hard to imagine a big enterprise basically developing its own DeFi application and basically attracting uh, a lot of usage, a lot of usage to that. So basically, given that that there's limited try to play, what can we actually do? And basically, this is where this infrastructure narrative came. It came around where we can say that well, actually, enterprises have been very good in doing other things. So like. T-Systems uh, as a like a big IT service company has been very like became I mean arguably famous or in, in Europe very prominent in terms of running and operating uh, IT systems of, of, of other large companies of running or providing a very secure uh, IT service. So basically, but this is what in case of chaining, basically in order to run a node, this is exactly what you need to optimize for. So you need to optimize for more or less traditional things like security, uptime, uh, availability, and so on and so forth. So, and, and that basically means that we can monetize the DeFi space, like we can get our right to play in DeFi space as a large company, as an enterprise from the infrastructure standpoint, because by running chaining oracles, we are basically our, let's say, future 
success or future revenue streams or whatever, basically the angle you look at it is dependent on the whole, in this case, DeFi space, uh, basically growing and, and, uh, and becoming more and more widespread and successful and so on and so forth. Because the more, this, the more dApps there will be, the more DeFi applications there will be, the higher the demand for the data, the more value it secures, the more value will be put uh, on actually secure price feeds on secure oracles, so that and that basically means that with the whole we will be basically participating in the growth of DeFi, but not from the use case standpoint, but from infrastructure standpoint. And I believe with that we kind of found uh, the right to play in DeFi, and not just DeFi, but I'll staking. I will talk about this a little bit uh, later. Uh, we are with this participating in generalized so-called generalized mining, uh, so we are providing a certain IT service to a decentralized network. So when like Jay Brookman invent, kind of came up with this term um, because he like, like proof of work mining with Bitcoin, it's basically taking some uh, resources like, like the, the hardware, like the ASICs and basically putting them to work for a decentralized network, contributing to like the network what it wants. And in the case of Bitcoin is uh, security, immutability and so on and so forth and getting rewarded for doing so in a digital asset. So with Chainlink, you can kind of see the comparison, I guess, with the fact that you are providing, you're taking, you're putting, you're spinning up the node, you're making sure it's very secure, reliable, as well as you're also providing some data on top of it. Uh, and you make sure that like, basically your data is not, uh, cannot, cannot be corrupted and so on and so forth. And that's the service you provide to a network. And that's how you get also, that's for what you are getting rewarded in case of chaining. So I believe we are the first enterprise in the world to uh, kind of monetize, uh, to basically work with a business model like this, where, I mean, there were some companies running blockchain infrastructure like nodes, uh, like big ones IBM, I think for private permission blockchains, they, I guess they do that quite a lot, but basically, but actually running public network infrastructure on a public blockchain network, as well as directly monetizing it via the native digital asset of that network. I believe this is something which we did. Uh, I mean, I like, I guess I shouldn't say we are the first one, maybe I don't know about someone or something, but at least from the big companies, we are, um, I would say the, the first one, definitely. Um, and um, what I also wanted to add is like what I sometimes talk about is that there were there have been a lot of news about um, a lot of news about like micro strategy right like buying Bitcoin holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet and like Square and I think there was a, another one but I mean basically actually our company is also I think we are like. In top, we are, I think 85 in a, like standard SMB, like number 85 or something. But I mean, essentially, by running this business models, we also hold assets on our balance sheet. In this case, like Ethereum would be one example, right? Chainlink. So, but no one is, uh, yeah, <laughs> no one knows about this, which I, I sometimes find uh, interesting. But I mean, I guess in the future, as we basically scale up, I guess that will become a more, let's say, more prominent uh, fact. So next stage is staking. Basically, we are like everyone, I guess, looking forward to proof of stake implementation, as well as we also, we are active on the staking business models, not just for chaining, but for other networks. And we are going scale through those um, as well. Uh, just some numbers. I, I, I don't think I would just give like the full numbers. I mean, anyways, a lot of people, I guess, on market.link, People can see our note. Uh, they can see basically the statistics about like the earnings and so on and so forth. But what I can say uh, at this point in time, this has been uh, like a profitable business model. So we are unlike. So we do as a corporate, we do have a lot of pressure on the business case side. So we need to we need to basically do business, which is also making us money. Uh, we are not running like a proof of concept to make sure to see like to test things out, but we're actually running a viable like business case and we want to scale it up. So basically we are doing it uh, profitably like this, what I can say. Um, uh, so I've seen some community, I guess this is what I didn't have too much time to talk about at the Smartcoin Summit. Uh, 
basically the journey has been quite volatile, I would say, to get a business model to work like this, uh, to like the business model like this to work in a big company. I think this is also kind of, yeah, obvious that uh, bigger enterprises are not exactly famous for being like too fast or too like agile in terms of like new business models and stuff. But um, that infrastructure narrative of which I'm going to talk about, like in the next part of the presentation, I think really helped us to push this through. And a lot of basically stakeholder management and education. So once you're kind of passionate about a project or about like a thing, I think with the due like amount of like convincing and uh, basically a lot, a lot of luck, obviously, you can you can push this through. So what we did, we raised internal funding for, for the project. Initially, it was not meant in the, in the beginning, it was not, not supposed to be chaining. It was supposed to be another network, but we still had the, that kind of generalized mining staking uh, business model, which we wanted to, to pursue. Uh, basically, it resulted in us, basically, we ended up with, uh, with chaining for the first network we went live on. Obviously, that involved a lot of protocol research and modeling the business case. Uh, a lot of basically development and internal audits because the big company has again um, i guess you can guess uh, uh, they it needs a lot of approvals as well as making sure that the business models and the technology really works so like on our end on the infrastructure side of things so the nodes and so on and so forth um, it involved coming kind of, kind of talking about stakeholder management it involved making a lot of departments happy which are the hardest to make happy in a big company. So I guess those could be like tax legal most of the time. But again, we we had we had a pretty some pretty cool guys on on board uh, with this who supported us with getting basically this thing through uh, through the corporate door. Uh, so partnering on boarding. So we are working with Castorian and a broker licensed uh, in Germany. I'll talk about this in the next slide. Also, the, the, probably the very hard thing was to include all of the new processes which come with such a business model, like, for example, uh, Baran Chenik node, we need Ether to basically feed the data into the network, and we're getting link out of it, right? So basically, having those assets, like having those new processes adopted or like somehow included in like our ERP systems or something like this has been also a huge uh, a challenge for us, especially when like the blockchain, it doesn't, you cannot send the invoice to a blockchain, right? So that's that, 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 that led to quite some funny discussions uh, internally. So obviously we launched our Chainlink node, I guess in the very, like probably in the worst time to launch a Chainlink node, uh, we launched it right into the FAT campaign. So I guess uh, people know which one I'm referring to, uh, as well as uh, basically the DeFi was just taking taking up. So at some points, the way were just astronomical. Uh, so it, it posed itself some challenges for, for us internally, like on the risk management standpoint. Uh, and I mean, obviously treasury management, as I said, we, we basically have to balance two digital assets. So it's good, in, like it's complicated enough when you have a one digital asset, which you need to somehow track and put in the systems and everything, but with uh, with chaining it basically uh, basically that squared because we have two we have costs in one asset and we have revenues in another asset. Both of them are volatile. So and basically, as you can see from the discussion from like these discussions, is that we basically turned ourselves into like a mini fund because we need yeah like we have to basically we are dealing with two digital assets which are one is like cost and one is revenue. We need to, like we are looking into hedging frameworks of how to basically make sure that in no way can our business case like turn against us. I mean, that would be like, I don't know, chaining price dumps and ether price like skyrockets or something like this. But I mean, that could be one scenario. Obviously there are multiple ways to tackle it, not just hedging. There are a lot of like, I would say collaboration and coordination things which can be done to like hedge against that. But from a pure, pure financial standpoint, like the prices are uh, the ones you look at when you like design hedging um, solutions. So we are talking, we were talking with some banks, like some banks, like even the bigger ones, basically they have no idea what we are talking about, but with the, with some smaller and more agile banks, I guess who are like, are more flexible in terms of offering some services around the digital asset hedging and stuff. That's basically where we are currently looking at. Um, 
So just how it works, I just wanted to very quickly show, I mean, I guess, how do, how did we structure de dealing with digital assets in a compliant way in Germany, uh, like for us in Germany, uh, like I guess it, it's pretty straightforward. So we have a broker, so this by in our case is, is, is Bankhaus Scheich from Frank Frankfurt and Fino as a, as, as a custody provider from Berlin, basically. And then there's the systems and then there's the chaining network. Right, so basically there's definitely some movements of tokens between the custodian and the broker. I mean, understandable whenever you want to buy something or sell something, that's like uh, basically custodian is the proxy, right? And then basically our cost side, as I said, is an ether, uh, is an ether. So we need to acquire ether to like purchase ether, right? So through the custodian and the, the broker, we then kind of feed the data into the network. And uh, okay, the chain is at the wrong place, but we are like feeding the data in the network, and for that, we are expensing the ether we bought, right? Because, like, we pay the transaction fee in the next stage. We are and for providing the data, what we earn is a link, uh, like link tokens, which we then in the next step will one like can or like may or may not sell for back to euros. To kind of cover our expenses or something like this because i mean as a big company as i pointed out we still have a lot of these kind of business case considerations which we need to fulfill from the management standpoint so and i will also refer to that what how it can change in the future in the next uh, slides um yeah blockchain infrastructure so this is kind of uh, uh, talking about i, I used this picture uh, before so kind of hearing all this people might think oh like uh, they are like hyping or something you know like they are doing the business this business model because i don't know there's a lot of money in the market or like we are in like whatever DeFi bubble or whatever they're hyping it up i would disagree with this um i would disagree with this for multiple reasons so what we what we published not so long ago was like the infrastructure like that we really blocks some infrastructure thesis where we argue kind of Try to explain from the enterprise standpoint how like how this thing work. Maybe a correction, just to be like super correct. I published it from my personal account, <laughs> so uh, this is not really that that might or might not be representative of the official view of the company, right? So just so just just in order so that no one then comes to me and says, "Hey, like you wrote this in your blog article." why did you write this or something like this but in general like what i can say is that all of our team is basically aligned with that vision and uh, with that um, kind of where we are going with this so the way we look at this i'll try to make it shorter because i want to keep uh, some time for for, for q a so why providing blockchain infrastructure so we live where we live in the world of many chains so there's not going to be a single chain uh, basically doing everything so in each chain has its own purpose and its own goal so bitcoin arguably what a, like i know peer-to-peer -peer cash or digital gold not going to go into like that uh, topic uh, and then chaining for example connecting uh, let's say off-chain data in a reliable way with uh, uh, on-chain smart contracts, like bridging that basically physical and digital uh, world gap. Ethereum coming up with like EVM, whatever, whatever. Uh, and basically in order to fulfill that goal, all of these networks rely on a distributed infrastructure. So a lot of nodes, otherwise it wouldn't be a blockchain, it would be a centralized system. So there needs to be a decent uh, number of nodes which are run reliably and, and, and securely, right? In this case, it's nodes, validators, and so on and so forth. Uh, and all of these blockchains basically are designed in such a way as to define good and bad behavior. So the good behavior is what gets you reward basically, and the bad behavior is what like either doesn't get you a reward or gets you punished in terms of like slashing, right? And here basically out of this comes this generalized mining concept where you are just you're looking at the network, you're looking what is good, what does the network considers to be good behavior, or good service, good activity, and you are you are basically providing that and you try to minimize or completely avoid ever running into like the bad behavior of the network. So this, like this, many people refer to blockchains as incentive machines, like that's basically what they are. They just program what is good, what is bad and, uh, and describe which rewards you get or which rewards you lose for either of those. And they're thus kind of an economic age, like autonomous economic agents 
or sometimes like refer to as commons, right? So blockchain can be also look like at the, like a river with the, where there is fish and you can be like, you can, you look at the river, you see there's fish and you decide, okay, how do I get that fish? And the laws of physics or whatever, I don't know, physics, nature, give you the, the way to get the fish out. You build a fishing stick and you go to the fish and you fish. And blockchains network are in, the, in this sense kind of similar where there's a blockchain network, there are tokens in the network, there are rules of the game written in whatever white paper in the code, which defined as good and bad. And then you look at that and figure out, okay, so how do I get those rewards? What do I need to do? Uh, and then you need to build a phishing stick in this case, like a node validator, and you build this in accordance to laws of like physics or in our case, like laws of blockchain, whatever. Um, and basically that's the comparison, I think, which is like pretty easy to kind of grasp. Um, there's, it's very hard for a new network to bootstrap infrastructure, pretty straightforward. Uh, as I pointed out before, why we believe this to be our even core business is because in terms of providing secure infrastructure, it's uh, not, there's not so much blockchain in it. It's uh, more or less uh, traditional DevOps security, which is like paramount, which is very important. The only thing different is the revenue you receive in digital assets. So once that is solved, basically you're good to go. You're doing your daily business. So that's what we basically solved in order to allow us to fulfill these business goals, right? Uh, very quickly, so why telcos is because telcos have been historically providing public network infrastructure. So from the phones, they're, they're building like telephone towers, lines, etc. With internet, basically now so information at scale, uh, there's internet backbone to cable service, so and so forth. If we look at Web3, a blockchain is kind of the value on top of that, like uh, a layer, sorry, a layer on top of that, which is like the layer where you can freely move a value around and transact and so on and so forth. The public network infrastructure at that level takes form of nodes, validators, block producers, transcoders, bakers, and so on and so forth. So if we look at from as a telco into this and we say, yeah, like this is the next public network we want to, our core business is provide infrastructure to public networks. So let's, I mean, let's provide this, right? If there's a business case. Um, so that was pure infrastructure view. There's what the blockchain space makes it extremely exciting is about is that there's basically always a financial layer on top of anything, like any basically token economics, any infrastructure like a validator, no, there's always a financial layer because there needs to be those incentives around running infrastructure, right? That these incentives have to be baked in the protocol. This cannot not just be like a company paying you hundred whatever per month on a subscription basis to run a node. The, all this has to be on chain and written basically in the economics of the chain. So we know like uh, fake shift is happening. No, I guess I'll talk too much about this. So staking, uh, it's like a means of active network participation. So, and like one custodial yield generation, right? So um, basically staking allows people to actively participate in the network, to take on some different role, participate in governance, uh, do all sorts of jobs, to fulfill all sorts of jobs. I mean, in case of chaining or the proof of stake, uh, that, that would mean that basically having secured a certain stake allows you to basically feed the data, uh, for the contracts, which like securing a lot of value for, for, for instance, right? So that's what enables a token holder of, I don't know, Link, or I mean, that would be the same for Tezos, Cosmos, Polkadot, whatever. It would mean that that's the way for a token holder to, to participate in the network by, and secure the network. So, and like kind of trying to draw parallels to the like normal people's world, right? They're the staking, uh, can be also looked at the form of elections. So basically people are voting with tokens, they're electing their representative who, because staking basically you have a choice how to run a known validator node or delegate to someone, uh, stake with someone, vote with someone, like all networks have different terminology, right? So, and, and here basically it's a means for you to elect someone who is going to fulfill the service on your behalf. So just like, I mean, on paper, right? Politicians like fulfill like, they represent you and they fulfill your kind of, they do work on your behalf, right? At least that's how, it, I mean, I guess it should be. Uh, and with staking makes it very like trans, like transparent on the code level, right? And 
A validator can also be looked as a bank uh, because the validator is the one who enables a token holder uh, to get exposure to the staking yields. And uh, so basically it's like going to a bank, putting your money in, and then get, they pay you some like small interest rate on the, on the money because they use it for their purposes, right? They like, they loan it out and stuff. They, they do some work with the money, right? So basically here it's the same, but that's non-custodial, which is key, right? Because we are not getting the tokens, but we are just getting the right for the token. And we are fulfilling some kind of work on your behalf as a token holder uh, with that uh, stake. Um, so that leads to there being a strong bottom-up demand for secure infrastructure providers, like from investors, like institutional as well as retail, as well as like anyone who has to deal with proof of stake assets. And we can see like exchanges offering staking services. We can see like uh, in the future, banks will offer staking services, custodians integrate staking as a service providers and so on and so forth. And the key here is that for most of them, this is not core business. And this is like super, super cool thing uh, that um, basically for the bank, to, I mean, let's, I guess, let's take live peer. It's like it's uh, like streaming, decentralized streaming, streaming network. So you need to stake your LPT tokens with a like live peer, like orchestrated transcoder, and they do video transcoding. So the video transcoder fulfills a very specific technological like IT service, but it allows you to get yield. Like it's not core business of a bank to run, to transcode videos, but this is a core business of the bank to provide yield. So there's this conflict. And that means that IT companies are now going to kind of eat into the bank's business, in my opinion, in the future. So once uh, like the crypto grows, so a lot of basically IT service companies will be way more positioned to, I mean, DeFi is eating like traditional finance, software is eating the world. And that's kind of also in that direction where IT companies is basically will be eating finance, in my opinion, slowly. Um, so. I'll speed up a little bit. So scalable business models make sense. It's not headcount driven, which is un uncommon for a corporate. Usually corporates are used to like having headcount driven business models, like consulting, especially. Um, growing market size as well, like the whole crypto market, the whole like proof of stake market, especially Ethereum going to 8.0, the whole addressable market for staking and providing secure infrastructure is growing. Market planning is growing. So. Basically, there have been some significant investments in blockchain infrastructure providers from leading VCs. Um, sometimes if you run a staking service or you generalized mining service, you're getting exposure to the uh, assets at a lower cost basis. So basically, like you have a choice, either go to the exchange and put like, let's say you have 100K, you can go and buy a token like Link for 100K. That's one option at the market price, or you can, potentially spin up the node and earn this and put this 100k into the secure node operation into securing like the feeds and earn the link and if you do it profitably that by definition means that you're acquiring the token at a lower cost basis than if you were just to buy it on the market and that, that this often leads to situations where early staking service companies for new networks can earn the tokens at a cheaper cost basis than what the VCs paid for like in seed round which is by itself a very powerful like, yeah, different uh, notion, I don't know, mechanic, right? Uh, I'll skip this one. I kind of talked about this and as well as in the conference. So uh, this is one which I like to talk about is there's this concept of uh, network lifecycle investing. Again, have to give credit to Jake Bookman uh, who came up with this concept. Uh, basically it says that the uh, networks, any centralized network goes through a certain life cycle. So there's an early stage where this, the assets are not liquid. They may be not yet live. The blockchain the mainnet is not live. The assets have a very strong like VC style character. They're not liquid. And uh, basically this is an early stage, right? Then there's a mid stage where the mainnet is launched. And then there's this whole, uh, infrastructure needs to be bootstrapped with reliable node operators, professional infrastructure providers and so, so forth, assets become liquid. And it's all about like governing the network. It's all about bootstrapping, uh, providing all of those services which are needed for the network to basically get started, like to get traction and so on and so forth. And then there's a late stage of the network where you have the, like the public assets, uh, like the assets become more, uh, let's say more liquid. It's really, and it's really about building use cases on top of a network. 
And all of these stages are interconnected and like reinforcing another, because if you are VC, but then you are also building the use cases, you are kind of contributing to the value accrual to your token, because I mean, if you build a cool business case, which creates all the value, that if, and if the token economics are right, then you can expect some value basically accruing to the token. And the same as mid stage, if you have invested in the early stage as a VC, you can use these tokens as an enabler for you to fulfill like those opportunities, like in staking, right? You can you invest early, and this is what, the, and then this is your own stake, which you have to like put up as collateral if you run a validator. Like some networks require you to put a self bond, like a Tezos, for instance, right? Uh, and I believe like we as a corporate right now are more, more or less like. In the second, in the mid and late stages of this, right? We are we want to run secure infrastructure, and we potentially would want to build like use case because we do have like this weird, like big company and a lot of like B two C and stuff like this. Uh, and but in the future, that's where I would all want us to go is to capture all the three things, right? So if like that's a very simple thinking, like if you're acquiring a digital asset at a lower cost basis than the VC would or the lower cost basis than if you were just to buy it on the market, then why not just hold it? Uh, like you are getting the asset anyways, then why like why would you sell it? You you would want to keep, keep onto the asset if you believe in the network, if you believe. And I mean, I guess that's the basic prerequisite to participate in the network you believe in, right? Because I mean, otherwise it's a very short-sighted kind of uh, bet. Uh, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll skip this. This just is the quadrant. We can run very data ourselves. Like chaining would be the right quadrant at the top. We are we are the ones running the node. We can also run it as a service on behalf of a bank, custodian, etc. We can do this for public networks, but also we can kind of do this also for permissioned and private networks. The business case there is not as transparent because it's not on chain business case, right? But still, like, those are kind of the business models possible. Where we are going, so we are going to continue scaling the, like our chaining project. We are going to add new networks. We are going to improve on our risk management and hedging, and uh, build up the platform for setting new nodes. Uh, basically, is a part of our regional platform vision. Uh, I don't talk too much. It, like before starting this, we had a kind of a slightly broader vision of having this as a platform. We decided to start smaller to have a build up. Uh, like the specific case, and then potentially expand to offering this kind of like more productized. But yeah, that's um, maybe something which comes in the short to midterm. Uh, I guess also we are, I guess we as a brand for, especially like when we talk in context of reliable infrastructure, I think like the brand can be kind of trusted, right? Uh, <laughs> We have a long experience of running secure infrastructure for big companies, for other big companies. Yeah, so not, not that much talk. I mean, if we are providing infrastructure, I guess the whole package basically comes uh, handy with the brand security certificates, compliance, uh, like regulatory, secure regulatory environment, and so on and so forth. As well as we are also actively looking into like the ways to add value, because especially in the public, Proof of stake space, there's a competition for like for staking the service providers. There's this so called race to zero fees, where the providers are very much competing on fees. And so there have to be a lot of value added services which you provide in order to capture the like bigger share of the market. So we believe there can be some, and we believe we are active in some in some of those already. Uh, yeah, next step, support new layer ones and uh, expanding our, like from the financial standpoint, right? So maybe hedging, maybe kind of moving into the whole life cycle investing. Um, yeah, so that's that's where we are. Uh, that, that's that's some funny, funny uh, like screenshot. I really like so that kind of summarizes it a bit, right? Uh, what are the major benefits? Like that, that, that's definitely one, I guess. So basically, being able to like sit here and talk to you guys, I guess this is kind of also an additional benefit which comes with dealing like with innovation, uh, like very kind of innovative business models. And so for, for, for which I'm thankful for like the team, uh, for everyone basically who supported and helped to get this thing going. 
Um, so feel free to reach out to me. Uh, feel free to read the infrastructure thesis, which uh, which I published. Um, yeah, and I guess we are also on time quite well. So let's just jump into the Q&A. So thanks a lot for your time. Awesome. Yeah, th thanks a lot for that glove. That, that was a great presentation. <laughs> yeah, people, people are loving that, that last slide. <laughs> Uh, cool. Yeah. So uh, I have a few questions here from uh, the audience that I think like the big one is, and you kind of touched upon this, what is like, where, where's the data come from um, that, that you guys are, are serving? Yeah. So that's, I guess, yeah, I also saw the question somewhere on Twitter. So the data we are basically taking uh, some, we have multiple API providers, which with whom we are working, we all integrate, we are constantly working on integrating new API providers. So all of those like pre premium subscriptions, so we can make sure that we have like a full, let's say transparency and data service. And I think the way, and what I like about Chainlink, the way it's expanding kind of, it, it, it's kind of, you guys trying to get rid of the single data API redundancy. So before some node operators were like working with one API, but now basically everyone has to integrate multiple. So basically to either make sure to switch them or in case there's some kind of, uh, deviate like huge deviation on one so there are like different ones you can basically switch onto to kind of minimize the potential negative impact on the whole network so that's basically that's essentially what we are doing we are adding new apis and uh, we'll add more in the future i guess cool yeah th thanks a lot for that answer uh yeah it's really interesting this this whole story and you kind of talked about it on on the slide and then also with like the analogy of of fishing uh but like the, the story of, you know, everything that actually goes into this and T systems, you guys are like creating this blueprint almost for other people to kind of follow and we're trailblazers really in this. So it, it's really exciting to be working with you guys and uh, definitely, definitely appreciate it. Um, going into like yourself a little, like personally too, like where do you see like the, the future of DeFi going? And we were kind of talking before with CBDCs and in, in, in Europe and some banks that are in Europe kind of talking about, you know, the, these are the futures. How, how do you personally view this? I mean, I think that's very, I mean, arguably that would be one of the first things to really get traction. I mean, I guess we also have to be kind of self-reflective in saying that uh, in 2017, everyone was saying ICOs are like the, the killer use case. Now everyone says DeFi is killer use case, but I do think that there's much more substance in what we're seeing like with DeFi today than what we have seen with like ICOs in 2017. Um, I mean, I think the, the most, the coolest things about DeFi is really that it's like composable that you can really like think that's what kind of enables those economies of uh, like network effects between each individual. Like a lot of smart people are working on this thing and a lot of smart people are working on another thing, but then those two things can actually work with one another, which is unimaginable in like the traditional world where you have like a startup and then they will see them as competitors or a big company would want like an IP or like all, all sorts of considerations, which kind of made it not possible before and where, but now with the, uh, Kind of ethereum and maybe i don't know some other chains will kind of we can see some other chain joining kind of or trying to join i mean i guess people have different views on if they're actually joining on the or if they're just trying to join or making it look like they're trying to join i don't know but uh, but basically we can see that uh, spread and uh, pretty excited i mean each each block each DeFi application like synthetics whatever have a, it deserves its own kind of whatever a slot workshop to just fully kind of understand what it might mean in the future if it succeeds or if it gets traction right so pretty exciting space to be in and yeah. from kind of from the our standpoint right what we what we like from this infrastructure narrative we are use use case independent so uh, kind of or one come so we are not limiting ourselves to one application because one application, individual applications can fail. But if, if you're providing infrastructure to a broader ecosystem, basically you are not really caring about individual companies failing or succeeding, but you just bet on the whole space, like a space as a whole growing. And I think that's the bet, which I guess we are definitely, I personally would be very comfortable making that the whole ecosystem would grow. 
Very cool. Yeah. And I imagine, so what was the culture shift like in, internally? Was everyone kind of like already like kind of considering cryptocurrencies and blockchain infrastructure as like a, a path down or did that take like a lot of, you know, internal advocating on, on your part and team? Uh, yeah. So it, it depends what you look at. If you look at blockchain or blockchain infrastructure. So the blockchain is definitely has been before I joined two systems. I mean, we had a big team of uh, blockchain guys and like from IT to from tech to like business finance guys, economists who were like working in this space. And we built some big, some use, some, like some projects, proof of concepts and use cases for larger companies like in automotive and finance and so on and so forth. So that like blockchain definitely, like I can never say that like blockchain just appeared uh, or something, but uh, that, that view of basically looking at the space, not from not that much from use case standpoint, but more from the infrastructure standpoint uh, from kind of trying to monetize all of, all of the innovation which is happening in the public space and really monetize it with a digital asset, I think that's kind of the shift which, uh, which happened. And like, again, I mean, we uh, are thankful to many people who contributed to this. And uh, yeah, so I'm glad, that, I'm glad this worked. Cool, yeah, it, it's, it's really exciting. And so I see one question here, um, like with this kind of staking model that you're thinking, it, that, that'll be KYC, correct? Um, anyone that kind of like wants to be involved with what you're thinking? I guess, I guess it depends. So yeah, it, we, uh, depends on the protocol. So what the amount, so it depends on the staker profile, right? So if you're working with a custodian, cause it's their problem to do the KYC, it's not your problem anymore. Uh, if you work with one big client, be it VC, foundation, etc., the same, they are KYC, right? Yeah. So it really depends what you are addressing and there are multiple ways how to uh, limit the scope of people you are addressing. And I guess, yes, that's definitely the concern would be from our lawyers is what happens if like we cannot stop anyone using our service, right? If it's like staking as a service. Uh, but uh, as I said, there are basically workarounds uh, around that. Uh, for some protocols, they are pretty simple. For some protocols, I guess they, they would require a lot of workarounds. But we, because we are just starting, we didn't really face that problem right now. Or we try to proactively look at the opportunities which do not involve those sorts of considerations at the very beginning. Got it. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that answer. Um, and I think we got time for for a couple more more questions. Want to be respectful of, of your time. Um, on one of your slides, you had the you know kind of what could be a model is other kind of like enterprises and, and companies kind of like using your infrastructure through you. Are, are you seeing interest of, of other like telecom companies or enterprises kind of kind of wanting to jump in? and either provide infrastructure or kind of kind of do this same same model as yourself yeah yeah i mean i guess the short answer is yes and the longer answer would be yes and it depends right on the use case it depends on the blockchain it depends on who is the one reaching out i guess what i see us doing uh, right now if is is keep working we have to like without basically being too precise but Basically, we have to look where the token holders are. And then if those token holders might not like might want to run their own infrastructure, but with like our knowing that we are the ones uh, running the backend, basically. So that, cool. Yeah. That would be the way to look at it. Exciting times. Um, sweet. Uh, yeah, I think that you covered most of the questions that we had um, and the audience had within the, the presentation. Is there anything else that, that you wanted to say um, that, that maybe um, anything, anything else? Uh, here, here's a good question. Um, like how, how do you prevent like unauthorized reselling uh, of T-Systems data yourselves? Unauthorized reselling of T-Systems data? What we, we are right now, we are not a data producer in our own Right, so we are not, at this point in time, we are providing the digital asset prices. So we, we cannot produce the digital asset prices ourselves. Like that would be like uh, whatever, a bank or clearinghouse, whatever, they would be the ones kind of producing the data, which they can then sell. 
uh, if we are thinking about like some potential future use cases, like whatever, like supply chain, if we are running a supply chain use case and we have like then T systems is the one running the supply chain or somehow integrating with the supply chain, then we would be the producers of the data. And I guess then that's when we will have to think about that problem right now. I, that, that's definitely not a problem which can happen to us right now. Maybe it can happen in the future. Um, then I'm not sure how, but yeah, I mean, that's actually an interesting question because if we are feeding the data on chain, then it's visible for everyone. And then, but I guess then there are lots of privacy. A lot of people are working on privacy and uh, we'll see. Uh, first people have to come to me with a very profitable, nice blockchain supply chain use case, and then we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll make sure to charge everybody. That happens, uh, that's not really an issue. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, again, glad if people want to follow you on, on Twitter, uh, where, where um, should they um, go and how, how do they follow you guys' progress? Yeah. So Twitter is my personal one is uh, my personal one is, is Hey Gleb, uh, like Hey and my first, yeah, my first name. And for any like T systems related, of course, follow like T systems uh, MMS follow T-Systems International, follow Deutsche Telekom, whatever. Uh, all of those are basically <laughs> entities we are affiliated or subsidiaries of. So uh, if you if there'll be some big information from the blockchain, you will definitely see it propagating basically upwards. So yeah. Uh, and I would encourage to read the infrastructure thesis. We worked like this took a long time to come up, to come to that. Uh, and took a long time to kind of structure the thinking process behind this uh, in in such a like in such a way. So any feedback for that, like more than welcome to implement, discuss, whatever. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you coming on here, Gleb. Uh, the community really enjoyed it, and everyone who's viewing in, uh, I'll make sure to drop those links in this afterwards um, and share the video. Also, stay tuned on the the YouTube. We'll be coming back with a, another another meetup with Chain Guardians, and you guys can help uh, design their next characters here here in a few minutes. So, again, Gleb, really appreciate it, and uh, have.